So good morning, guys. Uh, my name is Afkam Aziz, uh, Senior Director of uh, Platform Architecture. Uh, so uh, the, over the last couple of days, I spoke to you about uh, Ballerina. So I've been working with uh, Ballerina uh, in the recent past. Uh, and uh, MSF4J has been another project at WSO2 we, on which uh, I uh, worked on. So I wrote the initial uh, versions of that. So I, I invented a new, you know, where to hold this mic yesterday. So I just put it in the pocket over there, and then my hands are free. <laughs> so uh, what is uh, MSF4J? So microservices framework for uh, Java. So there are a number of uh, uh, Java microservices framework. Uh, so um, when it comes to uh, our core, we had some core design objectives. Right? It has to be uh, lightweight, high performant, and container native. Um, so these are some of the core design objectives. So during the uh, next uh, few slides, we will go through how uh, we achieve this, and we look at some of the core features uh, in MSFJ. Uh, so the vision is container nativity. So rather than uh, you can of course take uh, any library, you can take any server product and pack it in a container, and uh, you know uh, say it's uh, container friendly or it runs on a container. So during the early days of cloud, you know, people uh, just took uh, servers, standalone servers, ran, ran them in uh, EC2 instances, and said, OK, this is now cloud. Uh, it's running on the cloud. So but uh, those are not cloud native, right? Because in order to run on the cloud, there are some certain properties or certain aspects that uh, you need to uh, make use of. There should be certain uh, qualities uh, in your uh, particular framework or product, right? So that's why we invented the term called cloud native. Uh, so similarly, now people are talking about uh, container nativity. So if you're, uh, for example, if you have a piece of software uh, that takes more than 30 seconds to boot up in a container, um, that's not really container native. It's, if it's going to consume more than, say, one or two GB of memory, that's not container native, right? The whole idea about uh, containers is you should be able to spawn instances uh, quickly and terminate them quickly and you know, uh, reincarnate them very, uh, very fast, right? So, um, so content, container nativity is one of the uh, very uh, core aspects when it comes to microservices. And uh, when it comes to developing microservices, we need to have uh, simple, intuitive APIs and uh, deploying microservices. So these have to be very simple. So these are some of the core uh, objectives. And then, of course, uh, you should be able to monitor your met uh, metrics. You should be able to uh, look at how these, uh, the, the flows are taking place. You should be able to trace. Because now what you did do is uh, you take your monolithic application, break it up into multiple microservices. Now you have multiple network calls. It can fail anywhere. So you should be able to monitor uh, the entire thing, right? So you should be able to monitor end-to-end -end message flows. Uh, so these are some of the key design aspects uh, in MSF4J. So to give you a brief overview, uh, what we have is a simple uh, Java-based programming model. Uh, so one of the questions that I got uh, last time, or during yesterday's BOF session, uh, in Ballerina is if we have uh, Java libraries. So we have a rich set of Java libraries, and we can't just throw them away. Uh, we should be able to still use them. Uh, how do we uh, do that in Ballerina? Right? Uh, so uh, my answer was uh, you expose that logic as an endpoint right? or as a, as a service. So MSF4J is a rich framework for you to be able to uh, do that. So you have your business logic, you use your libraries, you expose it as a service which you integrate with other uh, microservices or ballerina and so on, right? Uh, fast boot up. So um, we have, I'll go through some uh, performance numbers. Um, so we have uh, in MSF4J, our services can be booted up within a few uh, milliseconds. And uh, we are working on uh, improving it uh, even further, right? Um, so now there should be uh, security mechanisms as well. So when you are running within a monolith, your component-to-component -component interaction 
doesn't typically have to be secured. So you're making like Java API calls. Now you broken it into microservices. Now the communication is happening over the network. So you need authentication, encryption, authorization. So there are uh, standards uh, and uh, there are libraries which uh, support this. So MSFJ includes uh, these, uh, the support for these uh, specifications and uh, of course monitoring and uh, metrics of the my, uh, microservices, MSFJ microservices is uh, a key aspect uh, of the framework. Um, so some uh, more implementation details. Uh, we have uh, an HTTP transport which is based on uh, Netivo. Um, we just added experimental uh, gRPC support. Kasun talked about uh, gRPC, so it's like protobuf over HTTP2. Uh, so this is a very uh, so this is becoming very popular when it comes to uh, inter microservice interaction gRPC. Uh, so experimental gRPC support has been added. Uh, to the framework, it's uh, still we haven't released that. It's uh, working in the master branch. Uh, streaming, so streaming requests and responses. Uh, so you should be able to run with a small memory footprint, yet you should be able to uh, stream, let's say, large uh, files. High performance, so throughput. High performance means uh, uh, you should be able to handle uh, comparatively high throughput. Uh, have low latency figures. So these are some of the aspects of uh, performance. Uh, small pack size. So typically we have a 5 MB pack size. So uh, we bundle it within a Docker image. Uh, and then if your uh, framework itself is taking up uh, 60, 70 MB, uh, it's going to defeat the purpose. So uh, small pack size starting within a few milliseconds. Uh, and again, uh, a very important aspect is the memory consumption of the framework itself, right? Uh, if you're, as soon as you boot up your, uh, your server or your framework, if the framework is itself is going to take up, let's say 200, 300 MB, on a specific uh, virtual machine or uh, on your, ha or your uh, hardware, bare hardware, you you'll be able to run just a limited number of instances. So uh, the framework shouldn't add too much of overhead. So, uh, these are core design aspects that uh, we've been concentrating on from day one. So more details about uh, some of the uh, other core features. Uh, so annotation-based programming model. Uh, so what we've discovered is uh, the JAXA RS annotation. So what we, ha what we have is uh, something similar to uh, the JAXA RS uh, annotations. So uh, most uh, Java programmers are familiar with uh, these annotations. So uh, so we found that uh, the specification uh, addresses most of the concerns. Um, so we have class level annotations, method level annotations, parameter level annotations, and so on, life cycle management. Uh, and then in addition, once you, uh, once you write your service, you should be able to expose your Swagger definition, right? Uh, so the Swagger spec uh, uh, has some uh, built-in annotations. So those are also supported in the framework. So we have uh, full Swagger support. So you can go from uh, you can go from a code-first approach. So you can annotate your code with Swagger annotations and go on to uh, expose your Swagger definition. Or you can start from your Swagger definition and uh, then generate your MSF4J service. So we'll uh, look at that uh, in some of the other slides. Uh, and another uh, aspect, uh, so this has been uh, something that our users have request, requested from us. So there is a set, uh, rich set of Spring libraries available out there. Right? So people uh, want to benefit from these uh, Spring libraries. Uh, so one of the functionalities that we have added is support for the Spring framework itself. So, uh, the dependence inj injection framework, some of the uh, spring uh, annotations such as uh, configuration, component, and so on are supported uh, within the within MSFJ. But uh, we haven't brought in uh, the full uh, spring framework uh, because of you know uh, it, def it defeats some of our design uh, goals such as uh, being able to have low memory footprint and so on. So when it comes to the execution, 
uh, what we uh, in the default mode what we do is we uh, bundle it up into uh, a single fat jar or an uber jar so you just uh, you don't need a server uh, you just uh, it's an executable jar uh, it packs everything you need into that and you can execute that and it makes it uh, super easy for you to bundle that inside a docker image um, so for streaming we have uh, different ways of streaming so there's streaming input as well as streaming output right so as a developer you should be able to receive let's say there's a large file upload right so you want to work with let's say 20 mb of allocated memory for a particular process uh, but you should you want to stream large files right let's say there's a file upload scenario right so we deal with uh, that by using http chunking so these are these are some of the api methods that uh, we've uh, given so every time you receive a chunk we call the chunk method and then uh, when the final chunk is received we call the finished method so for example let's say uh, your uh, a streaming file upload is taking place so when each chunk comes you can simply uh, you know open a file channel to a file in your file system and you can simply keep on writing them <coughs> or if you do not want to do that let's say in certain scenarios you want you don't want to deal with uh, the chunking right you want uh, the server or the framework to take total control build the entire message and hand it over to you so chunk aggregation is the feature that uh, allows you to do that so that's also uh, supported and the other thing is let's say uh, is a file download scenario like streaming output or let's say uh, a call comes in and then uh, you look up uh, a do uh, you do a database lookup and then you get uh, let's say 100000 records now you can't send that as a single message you need to be able to stream your output right so we have an api that allows you to do that so as and when you read new records or as and when you read uh, certain uh, uh, length of bytes from your file you can now write to the uh, output stream right so your client who called your service can now just keep on receiving uh, a, a continuous stream um, so we have uh, another core concept called interceptors uh, so as a service author you concentrate on the business logic and you write your services but uh, you want to now reuse this service which with uh, let's say uh, different uh, uh, characteristics so let's say you want to log all the messages that are coming in to your service or you want to enforce basic auth for your service so you don't burn that into your business uh, method what you do is um, you uh, write your service so as a developer you concentrate on your logic you write your service and then you put an interceptor if you put the oauth interceptor what it does is it will enforce oauth on your particular service so the interceptor model works like that um, so for file handling we have a number of apis so this uh, works hand in hand really well with uh, the streaming uh, so now if you have uh, as your method input parameters if you have a file input stream uh, and so on you could will automatically you know uh, do some, do the streaming for you and uh, when it comes to streaming output we are using the uh, standard uh, streaming output uh, juxares class uh, so a bit about uh, the grpc support so this is uh, hello world uh, in uh, uh, grpc so this is the proto file uh, so you define your uh, you can define your service and your uh, messages like this so hello service uh, receives a uh, hello request and uh, returns a hello response so this is the uh, interface definition so from this you can generate the msfj service uh, have your uh, logic there uh, and the same uh, interface definition will be used on the client side to generate the client so now your server and client can talk over grpc so this is uh, in uh, early experimental stage and uh, the team is even now the team is working on this to improve uh, this area so uh, this is something that you will get with the next uh, next release exception mapping uh, 
So when it comes to uh, exceptions, like when you call a particular service, uh, sometimes you get a nasty stack trace, right? That's not the desired behavior, right? Uh, because uh, that's the Java world, and you're talking over HTTP and sending you know, the exception as the HTTP payload uh, is not a nice way of you know handling that particular interface communication. So uh, what? Uh, this standard allows you to do is, it allows you to work in the Java world, you work with exceptions. So because that's the most natural way to deal with, uh, with uh, exceptional conditions in the Java world, right? You deal with exceptions, but when it comes to communicating over HTTP, you have to convert that into a proper HTTP response, right? So a proper HTTP response should have a proper uh, status code, so it can be a, HTTP 500, 404, or whatever, right? Uh, so the exception mapping framework, what it does is, it allows you to say, okay, if this exception occurs, it maps to this kind of HTTP response. This is going to be the status code, and so on. So in the Java world, you just deal with exceptions. You throw a business exceptions, but that will be automatically translated into uh, proper HTTP response messages. Uh, so I think the those of you at the back may not be able to see it here. Uh, so what you do is you simply uh, register certain exception mapper classes. So within that, you do the mapping between HTTP to Java. Uh, circuit breaker is another resiliency packet pattern. Uh, we've spoken about it a bunch of times. Uh, Ballerina supports it uh, in its uh, resiliency framework. Uh, MSF4J also uh, supports the same thing. Um, so the whole, I think even like Isuru spoke about this in uh, one of his uh, sessions. Uh, the whole idea is, you know, you talk to a particular endpoint, and the, if the endpoint keeps on, you know, uh, giving you an error, of the, or if the endpoint is down, you, it's, it's uh, pointless to keep on, uh, you know, sending messages over to that endpoint. So uh, the circuit breaker, what it does is, okay, I try three times, you didn't respond, or you failed, so I trip the circuit and I don't send any messages to you. So in a microservices environment, that sort of gives some time. So if uh, one particular instance was overloaded, what it could mean is it could give some time for that instance to recover, or maybe give the orchestration framework to terminate that instance and boot another instance in its place. So that's a sort of a uh, mechanism which uh, allows you to, uh, allows the, frame, the, the system to heal, right? Uh, so, uh, after a certain timeout, what the circuit breaker would do is it would uh, just, when a request is destined to you, it might send a request, and if you uh, respond correctly, then the circuit is uh, closed and uh, normal communication resumes. Still, when you send uh, a message, so this is called the half open state, uh, if, the, uh, if there is an error again, you go back, back into the open state. So that's basically how the circuit uh, breaker works. Uh, so that's uh, available as a feature in uh, MSFRJ. Uh, security is done through uh, interceptors, like I mentioned uh, in one of the previous previous slides. Uh, so there are a bunch of ways of doing it. So you can uh, do use uh, OAuth, JWT, and so on. Analytics and monitoring, uh, very critical for microservices. So we have uh, annotations for that. So you can uh, look at how long each of your microservices operations took. So timed, uh, metered, counted, right? How many uh, re requests your service is receiving, uh, your HTTP monitoring stuff. So these are all based on a bunch of annotations. So here, this is a very simple uh, console output. Uh, so when your, your service can now publish uh, these metrics periodically to some endpoint. So, uh, in the simplest case, so this is from one of the sample services, the metrics sample service. Uh, it is, uh, it prints it out to the console. So you can see the request per second, uh, the uh, number of uh, events it has received, uh, how long each event took, the uh, 70, 75th percentile, 95th percentile, and so on. So all this uh, data is available. Uh, and then uh, the same data is available over JMX, so if you're using uh, a JMX uh, framework, you can publish it to that. 
uh, and then we have a uh, dashboard which allows you to see the HTTP uh, related stuff. So this works for only HTTP at the moment. So how many, the response times of different endpoints, uh, the uh, number of calls, number of errors from a particular endpoint, all that data can be monitored. Right. Yeah. Do you support Prometheus uh, exposure? Of your uh, not at the moment. We have uh, Zipkin uh, support for tracing, but not Prometheus. No. So that's not tracing? No. From yeah, not from metrics. You don't have uh, that support. So that's something that uh, we can add on. So you only support access to putting your metrics out to analytics? Uh, analytics and Zipkin. So uh, for Zipkin, it's only for tracing at the moment. Yeah. Uh, so throughput and uh, concurrency, uh, some of the uh, graphs from, uh, uh, so what we do is we uh, regularly uh, run our uh, tests against uh, these different uh, frameworks out there. So uh, uh, throughput, so these, uh, the throughput graph for the simplest uh, case, uh, an echo test. Uh, so uh, we seem to be a bit uh, higher on the throughput uh, graph. And then uh, throughput with uh, IO, so that's a different case uh, because when with IO there is blocking. So we want to study the frameworks and see how each framework uh, behaves uh, when it comes to IO when there are about blocking calls. So you make a call to your particular service and that does a blocking call and then sends you a response. So uh, then uh, memory usage. So that's another important aspect. So this the x-axis is uh, uh, the, the concurrency. Uh, so you can see uh, here, uh, MSF4J is around in the middle. So uh, something that uh, needs a bit of improvement, but uh, uh, we are uh, not as bad as some of the other, uh, you know, uh, popular frameworks which are quite uh, memory intensive when it comes to uh, high concurrency figures. Uh, so again, this is for the file read write. Uh, so latency. So latency is another. Uh, metric that you have to uh, look at uh, hand in hand with uh, throughput. Uh, so uh, we are doing pretty well when it comes to uh, the latency figures. So that's a uh, median. Uh, so the median latency uh, looks good as well. Uh, some of the tooling aspects. Uh, so tooling is uh, very important when it comes to like developers. So how do you generate a project? So we have a Maven archetype. Uh, so we have the microservice archetype. So if you create the microservices archetype, what it does is it will uh, generate the project structure for you, and uh, it will have all the relevant dependencies imported for you. So you just have to uh, write your code and uh, run a Maven build, and uh, you could uh, have that ready to run. So if you want to start from Swagger, we have a, a different uh, command line uh, tool for that, Swagger code gen CLI jar. And you give the uh, Swagger JSON file, and it will. Uh, so this is a standard. Uh, this is a standard uh, Swagger code gen CLI. So those of you who have used this, uh, this framework can generate uh, files for Spring Boot and other uh, Java microservices framework. So that's why here we have specified MSF for J. Right? It's a, so it will generate the MSF for J uh, uh, class files and project structure for you. Uh, when you use uh, this tool. The Swagger editor works as well. So editor2.swagger.io. So we have, uh, we have uh, these are the frameworks that uh, this particular uh, tool supports. So swagger.io has this editor, uh, online editor. So MSF4J is available there as well. So you could simply point to a Swagger file and uh, generate MSF4J, uh, uh, an MSF4J project. So Spring Boot uh, is one of the most uh, popular uh, uh, frameworks out there. So a bit of a comparison. Uh, Throughput-wise, we are like uh, almost similar. Uh, latency, MSFRJ uh, displays lower latency at uh, higher concurrencies. And then uh, on startup, memory footprint on startup, uh, uh, there's a big advantage. Uh, minimum memory requirement, uh, we can run with uh, 7 MB. So we have done our some of the benchmark testing with uh, uh, by reducing the memory. So we can run with uh, 7 MB. Uh, distribution size 6 MB. 
uh, so uh, there are a bunch of stuff like that so uh, the uh, developer uh, uh, the, the some of the standard annotations and all that stuff swagger annotations there's all uh, out of the box support uh, in msf4j so you can uh, uh, get started uh, you can go to uh, the github page uh, the release is uh, available there uh, and the be and a good place to get started is with the samples so it demonstrates uh, so the samples are organized uh, you know in the order of uh, in order of uh, increasing complexity so the final sample is called uh, the pet store sample which shows a full uh, microservices solution in action so it has uh, like uh, uh, it has a it runs on kubernetes so you have to uh, it's a bit of a complex sample you need to set up kubernetes and then uh, uh, you can run our scripts to actually do that um, so it will uh, deploy a number of microservices and it will uh, handle the communication between them you will be able to see the uh, tracing so uh, that's a good sample to get an understanding of uh, you know uh, how to develop a complete uh, microservices based uh, solution so thank you. Uh, so I'm open for a couple of questions before Isuru starts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I can speak up. What's the yeah. locking framework you support or use? Uh, logging. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, we are just uh, using uh, Log4j. But uh, what we uh, are considering is like you have to re uh, uh, rely on something like Logstash or Logrotate uh, to uh, uh, publish it to some external uh, thing. So we don't uh, have a central uh, logging framework. Anything else? Any other? So I think you can. Thanks.